Good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever, uh, whatever time or wherever you may be. It is John Summers, the motoring historian, with his school friend Mark Gammy for another hour or hour and a half or however long we feel to talk a load of bollocks about cars. Kind of about cars. Um, how are you, Mark? I am all right, thank you, sir. Yourself? Yeah, you know, I, I'm doing uh, I'm doing pretty good. We've had a We've had some stormy weather here in in uh, San Francisco, and uh, the weather has got out nice again. And uh, you know, there was a whole two weeks that went by where the road was wet, and I didn't want to ride motorcycles. So I would look at the weather forecast and then be like, and, and it's only as I say this to you now, I think that's so bloody California to be like, oh, I just wait for a sunny day to ride. Because in England, I just used to get out and ride anyway. But I guess it's a combination of my old age and. Uh, and an increased sense of uh, security and responsibility and uh, and all of that jazz. I mate, I'm, I, I, I'm a fair weather rider. I am a portly old git now, and uh, I'm I'm waiting for the blue skies myself. So, although I am going to get a dirt bike at some point soon, and then uh, I will ride that whenever. So, yeah, on green lanes, not on the road. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm still trying to persuade Dana to uh, acquiesce to uh, to Ollie riding. Um, we were uh, he was doing his goalkeeping practice um, in Sutra Park the other day, and some five year old came by on an electric bike, um, an electric dirt bike, right? And I just want to I, I want to highlight right that I think at the moment, both legally and culturally, there is a gap at the moment around electric bikes, right? So in other words, if I buy Ollie one of these $400 two-stroke Chinese 50cc bikes that you see on Amazon for three or $400, right? If I buy him one of those, I'd have to go and pick it up in Nevada because they're not allowed in California. But let's say I like shipped it to a PO box in Nevada or something and then went and picked it up and, and he could have it here. here. If I had that, if he had that running around in Sucho Heights, right, somebody had called the police on him in no time at all, right, on me, right? Whereas this lad on the electric bike, because it's quiet, because he doesn't have clouds of blue smoke, he's just a little kid riding around on the electric bike. So Ollie was like, well, can I get an electric bike? So I was like looking at prices and, and sizes and so on, because he's a bit he's a bit bigger now. And I came to the conclusion that no, basically, because if he if I put him on an electric bike, that bike would be like the size of a KLX 110 or something like that now, like the electric bike would be. And that would be too big. Right. That would be, you know, the old woman walking a little yappy dogs. Instead of being like, oh, cute, you know, the lad's riding over the berms, it would be, you're going to run me and my dogs over and, you know, given how Ollie is on a pedal bike, I know how he'd be on a powered bike. So, you know, he has this skid every time, right? When he comes to stop, he always steers a bit and then gets the brake on. So he does it like a bit of speedway, right? He's going to fall off. Right. But I've told, I told him that a month ago and he's just been doing bigger and bigger and bigger skids and not falling off. So, you know, what what does dad know? Um, well, those 44 te- teeth boys, um, Al did his review, didn't he? Of the um, was it a KTM 50 CC or something like that versus the equivalent electric dirt bike? And his lad was basically pro electric. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was thinking, uh, I've been driving the Mercedes, there's that old E55 I, uh, I have, and, and uh, it, it's so smooth and the power is so instantaneous. And it has this sort of, I mean, that's why, they, why you know, uh, Jason's son called it the flying couch. I mean, it has that feel, right? All those characteristics are the characteristics of electric cars. It's like when Cadillac said they were going all electric, and they were one of the first makers to do it. Instead of being like, oh, what a disaster. I was like, well, those are the virtues of Cadillac anyway. You know, the smoothness. And, you know, and I, I'm put in mind of, you know, before the war, 
the Packards and the Duesenbergs and the Cadillacs of that era, the idea was that you couldn't hear it running. It was silent running. So the reason that you did 12 cylinders wasn't because it made more power because it could rev higher. It was because it delivered better torque and it was smoother and it was quieter. And the notion was that you could rest a quarter on the engine block, you know, and the quarter wouldn't fall over. The thing was, the thing was so smooth. I feel like we moved away from that true luxury, that notion of, of true luxury. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, um, the whole, I mean, electric is coming, it is, is, is the future, or whether I mean, and it looks like it's unlikely to segue sideways into hydrogen anytime soon, even though that might be a better the specific impulse looks to uh, uh, output or whatever it is, looks a bit too weak. But and again, I mean, I listened to um, a radio show today on the BBC talking on Radio 4, um, uh, sliced bread, I think, so, as in like, is it the best thing since? And they ask sort of answer readers' questions. And I mean, you know, even if you charge up your electric car at home and your previous car was, you know, beyond economical repair, so there isn't the argument about whether or not you could you needed to buy one, um, you're still looking at between fifty and eighty thousand miles if you if you only charge up at home before you save the the differential in cost between an electric car, you know, electric Astra and the equivalent, you know, small diesel, mm-hmm. um, which is a lot. Uh, and if you're not in that position to actually need to swap out now, there's no argument to do it. And you know, the net net is that if you look around, you know, ignoring all of the economics, and of course, you know, now with the petrol price has gone through the roof, you can be paying 70p a, 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 a kilowatt unit or whatever it is now um, at service stations and so forth. And there was four hour queues for the Tesla chargers at Christmas time at the service stations on the way down on the way when people were heading home. Um, you know, the, this, the infrastructure is woefully lacking behind the governmental amb- ambition, sadly. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would, uh, I would completely, um, I would completely agree with you there that the, that the infrastructure is not there. Um, I'd also put to you, um, and stop me if you think you've heard this one before, but I, I also put to you that I feel like the people who buy electric cars are the people who are least able to cope with motoring challenges, which the motoring challenges, which are constituent of the electric car experience. So in other words, you need to plan where you're going to stop. You can't just drive and get there and gas up whenever, you know, the, we've, we've rolled back the the convenience. And I was thinking about this with, with my mum, that that when we were at school together, my mum didn't drive. And, and given that she ha- has done since and gets on well and loves modern modern cars, my parents have a, a Volkswagen Tiguan still, like a 2016. She loves that. She loves the sitting up high. She loves the smoothness of the diesel. She loves the fact that it's an automatic transmission, but it's not slow. Um, you know, all of, all of that stuff, right? That all happened. She didn't like the light. She didn't like the choke. The choke terrified her, you know, between the choke and the clutch. You took those two things away. It turned. It made my mum mobile. It made my parents able to live out in the countryside. So, you know, I feel like electrification has sort of rolled us, rolled motoring back to the way it's that it was. It's not for that, is it? I mean, or at least at the moment, um, in the sense that if you live outside of town and you do long journeys semi regularly, it's not for you. Um, yeah, it's definitely not for you. commute, short it, it run regularity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that's why you know we've we've on our agenda of of cars to to talk about. But that's why I think's most interesting about a car that's not on our agenda to talk about the Citroen Ami, because that Ami is like I know it, it's like uh, made out of the same material as a porta potty's made out of. Oh, the Ollie. No, the Ami. The oh, Ami, right. the little one. The Ollie's the one on our list that we can talk okay. about in a minute. I don't think I've even uh, seen the Ami. Oh well, let's let's talk about the Ollie. And whilst we're talking about the Ollie, you look at the Ami. Um, right. I so we we our little agenda was about electric cars today, anyway, and we're jumping around on the agenda. But you know that's you and me. Um, I oh, I have that. seen that one. Yeah, sorry, it's quite cute. Yeah. So I, I think both of them are fucking awesome design. I I get what you know, 
Lucid and Rivian are trying to do. But I, I'm just a bit like, you know, that feels a bit like, you know, I'm excited for the next Model T. It's the next Model T that really excites me. And it excites me in the way that when I used to sell text products, I was interested in what the next generation tech could could do. Mm. And yeah, yeah. I hated Tesla, partly because I just didn't know what to make of them. I just didn't know how to interpret them when they first came along because it seemed to, it was fast, but without the fun, without the viscerality. It was, you know, they had looked at what Porsche did and just did jelly mold size. And you were like, well, that's because Porsche are all about the 911. They have this like halo model. What's your halo model other than your founder's goddamn giant ego? You know, like I, I just... I, yeah, then, you're waiting for the skyline. Do you know what I mean? You're waiting for, yeah, waiting for the yeah, Japanese well, well, to go, this is, like, this is how we do it. And then you go, well, shit, that's effective. I like that. That's amazing. That's your own. You know, you're not trying to be Ferrari. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah like the skyline being this being the ultimate expression of the Japanese, it's not copying anymore, but no. doing something terrific. All of yeah, them, just out. amazing, all on its own. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And like, I mean, look, it, I suppose it shouldn't have been a surprise that it came from Citroen. Um, but yeah, I watched a review of that. I mean, and it's a show car; it's a sort of lab laboratory thing. But I mean, it's genuinely impressive. Loads of quality, the cool. And uh, different thinking uh, for the Ollie. I haven't watched the Ami stuff, but I, they had a couple on the picture. And I oh, thought the philosophy is the same. The philosophy is the same. Instead mm. of, do you know how heavy the Rivian is? It's like seven thousand nine hundred pounds, right? <laughs> it's like I said to Ollie, like that's three Mustangs, three of our Mustangs. He went three. I went three. Mm. Imagine how that would feel plowing into you a uh, hundred miles an hour. Like, and yeah, that was the main standout thing for that Ollie. It's like, what, 2,200 right. pounds? It's yeah. like a thousand well, kilograms. Right, windscreen and the doors and all of that. All of that's fucking clever. But mm. the main event about that Ollie is that it's about lightness. Well, and, and also, about, they, they reckon, because they can put a smaller, was it a 70 kilowatt hour battery or something in there? So therefore, they can make the thing for 20 grand. Like yeah. 20 grand. That's like yeah. actually the price yeah. of a golf rather than that plus yeah. 15 grand more. I mean, yeah, now. Amazing. Now I'm excited about electric mm. car, right? Tesla, now we're really, and, and you said it came from Citroen. I looked at it being like, I'm feeling the Citroen 2CV here. The AMI was launched right alongside um, when Paris introduced their new like 19 mile an hour speed limit, right? It's 30 kilometers or something. Okay. And I'm like, and I'm like, wow, Citroen, have grasped the reality of urban transportation in the future yeah. with that. The Ollie doesn't do any more than 69. That's it. Well, the Ami is even, like well, he's even slower than that. Yeah. And what they've done is they've, they've done one vehicle for people who live right in the city, and they've done another vehicle or for people who, you know, might want to go out of town at the weekend, you know, and, you know, but but this is the the... This is what I've, I, I, I believe, I don't know France and, and French people very well, but in California, you know, I mean, our friends that we spent Christmas, that we spent New Year's with, that uh, we're going to talk about their couple of new cars, Tesla Model X and, and Cayenne GTS late, later in the, in, in the sort of little presentation in our like, little thing today. But, you know, they would never drive even though the cars, they would never consider driving between LA and San Francisco, you would fly. So in other words, any journey that's longer than a couple of hundred miles, most people don't want to do it. In the pandemic, my wife moved to a stage where she doesn't want to be in the car for longer than about an hour. She's fine driving around town, but she doesn't know when she gets out on the freeway, she doesn't know what to do. Now me, I'm like waiting for that moment where you can just sit there and you know survey the world. Like I feel like that's like the big. I love nothing more than that moment when when you're going somewhere and the car's packed and all the bullshit's done and you're just like out on the highway. That moment where you move into the left-hand lane and switch the cruise on. That is that's a 
pinnacle moment. That's a yeah, yeah, yeah. like picking up the front wheel moment right there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, let's see what, like, you know, it's Planet Rock's got or a bit of smooth country. If I'm feeling like US vibes today, then, you know, let's see what's going on. Yeah, that's not what. Um, that's not what most people do, to be fair. And, and that's um, not what these electric cars are designed for. That's not what they're they're designed no, for. No. Before. And I mean, look, you know, maybe this what's that that new Mercedes long tail thing that's like going for a thousand kilometers of range on a single battery charge or something. I mean, it's ugly, but like whatever. I mean, you know, it's it's a, again, it's a it's a technology showcase thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's coming. Um, but what yeah, do you think about Jaguar? Exciting, that's, but... the, that's the top thing on our list, card on our list to talk about that ca- funky cat aura. Which at that time I'd not seen the Ollie, so didn't know what the Europeans were doing. I'd only seen Mercedes kind of doing that EQS blobby affair. That cat aura, you can go buy that right now, it's 25 grand in England, something like that. You can't get it here. Um, I, I am struck by it because i feel like electrification is going to be the niche that the chinese need to build a market in europe and later dominate i feel like and i don't think they've delivered their skyline i don't know what their cars are you know apart from copies at the moment they definitely haven't delivered the skyline i the the cat aura is like a step on the road. It's, and, and the Cat Aura sits really nicely against the Ollie because the Ollie has all this exciting design that's at an affordable price point. Whereas the Cat Aura is at a similar price point, right? I, I, you know, the, that, that concept car is not, you know, they, I, I see those as similarly priced kind of, kind of it. Well, the Cat Aura is something you can buy right now, right? Um, I have to say, I didn't. I thought it was a bit dull. I mean, the guy seemed quite excited about it in the video in terms of its styling. But, you know, trying to look like, you know, sort of take Porsche styling cues on that sort of little car always feels like you're sort of fronting a max in a bit. Yeah. I mean, like, really? I mean, just uh, just for, our, uh, for our listeners, or, or one of them, me, whilst I'm editing it, um, just for our listeners, Johnny Smith, late break show. And, and he's my elect- car electric, electric car guru. You know, and he, and he, I realized he verbalized what I'd been thinking, which is that this antagonism between electrification and gas power is dumb. It's just dumb. There's room for everything, right? So he's like electric car guy. He's testing a VW Buzz at the moment, but he has a 68 Charger, which in England, you know, probably wouldn't be my choice, but like, you know, power to him. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 coming. I think it's got a use case. I mean, it really has. I mean, it doesn't fit my use case, but that I'm in a minority. I'm not the the, mo- the motoring public at large. So, um, yeah. I mean, and you know, if I lived in town, you you don't want to be starting up a you know straight six every time with a noisy exhaust every time you leave the house. I mean, it's a bit silly, isn't it? So you know, it's. Um, but I don't. So, you know, man, you know, most of the times we take the Fiesta but pottering around anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just looking at uh, our agenda here. Um, so the, whilst we're on the theme of these electrics, um, another unusual thing, I, I would go so far as to say bloody stupid thing is the fact that you pay a premium like between the, Hyundai Ionic 5 and the Kia EV6, or the EV6 and the EV6 GT. That's the two. EV6, EV6 GT, and Mustang Mach-E and Mach-E GT. The GT models deliver more performance for a higher price, right? So far, so normal. But they deliver less range. Yeah, well, but people always wanted to dick measure, didn't they? I mean, it's like, you know, they yeah, want to go out and sit, sit on the lights and show up to their cost how fast you, it can you, go. You could, you could use, I, when, when, you know, when you dick measured your Cortina 2-litre gear against your colleague's 1.6L, there was like, you know, a tangible velour sunroof and... 95 miles an hour instead of 90 difference right there was a tangible difference i i i I don't believe the difference in performance of electric vehicles is remotely tangible i don't believe you can use it 
I can't use all my Fiesta ST on the road. No, you Let definitely alone. can't use the M2. I mean, it's but it's about but you can get away with the traffic light Grand Prix a bit better, I guess, given it's quiet. But I don't want. I'm I'm a performance vehicle enthusiast, and I don't want the 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 GT variety of it because I don't mm. want to be worried. I'm more worried about range than I am about half a second off my naught to sixty time. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um... Yeah, very much so. Um, so why, why would you do the GT model? It's total dick measuring. Yeah. Well, utter, utter dick measuring. And it was stupid with gas-powered cars. But, mm. you know, we love them and we're small boys. But now they're electric. It's it's like, it seems like, it's like a throwback to... But that was one of Tesla's know. main selling points, wasn't it? You know, that the, it's faster. That you know you could have electric, but it's quick and it looked like a boring blobby sedan, but it was faster than like a Ferrari. That was one of their their um their things. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Maybe they success. You see, I just feel this is a different technology, right? And I used to feel that I just wasn't enthusiastic about it, but then I and I think maybe it was because Johnny Smith did a video on that cat aura months and months ago, you know, like maybe more than a year ago. And that was the beginning of me thinking, you know what, there's something, there's like the stirrings of something interesting happening here. And that Citroen Oli, and there's other vehicles like that that we could talk about, but that Citroen Oli, the AMI is what they've always done really well. It's like, mm. you know, it's, it's like a port, it looks like a disabled porta potty on wheels. That's that's what it With looks funky like. Funky AMI. The, the AMI, the AMI yeah. does. But the Ollie, the Ollie is is like, wow, we can actually do good design. Because BMW, the these electric BMWs, I mean, they're goddamn ugly. And they're just big fat bastards that you just with a bunch of performance that you don't need and aren't going to use. It just feels a bit bloody pretentious to me. But well, dick measury, yeah. and I'm not a dick measury kind of guy. No, so I mean, if they don't make them like, then the range is a problem. Um yeah, you know, we're, so, we're, we're planning another couple of holidays this year. Angie's still waiting for another operation. Therefore, it's probably going to be in the car. Therefore, I'm probably going to be doing, you know, 500 plus miles a day for at least a few days. And I'm not stopping three times for a couple of hours at the service station. Like The irony, the irony that these vehicles with range, with a range similar to one of my sports bikes, like, <laughs> you need to be gassing up as much as that. And it's called the GT. I mean, the mm -hmm. whole notion of the GT is what right. Harry, Harry Garage's guy does is you have your yacht down in Antibes, you get in the car in the morning in your farm in England, you drive down there. You don't stop. You gas up. That's all. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's, uh... hey, so why don't we move on to the Ferrari Pura Sang? Now, you put this on our little agenda. I don't even know how to spell it. You had some piece about its suspension or steering. I I would just preface my remarks by saying, yeah, all right, Ferrari SUV, Vaffanculo. But I also feel um, you need to see these things in the flesh, really, to get a real proper sense of it. Um, you also need to experience it in the, the butt somewhat. And I know from driving that, um, 07 or whatever it was Durango that I had that had the Hemi I mean it looked ugly it was terrible and when you sat in it the interior and everything was was terrible and it was all absolutely horrendous other than that moment where you came in the throttle and the V8 pulled it along and and that elevated the whole experience the whole thing was it wasn't it wasn't like it was the VA. It was just that moment where you tipped into the gas that it elevated it far beyond any other SUV that of you know comparable um, SUV. Um, so the Purasang, like I get powerful SUVs is what I'm saying, but you know yeah. you couldn't pay me to have a Cullinan or a Bentayaga. I mean I don't want one. This is a bit clear, um, but. What I was most interested in, I watched a couple of videos on it. Just uh, Harry did one. I think I watched another or part of another one. The most interesting I th thing I thought on there was, I mean, apart from the fact they're big now, these some of these cars. I think it's got twenty four inch rims on the back and twenty three on the front. 
I mean, that's a big ass wheel. Um, given old uh, DRE was singing about 20 inch rims um, um, not that long ago, and they were big ass wheels. And now, yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah, but he was also singing about his 98 Oldsmobile, which well, no, then. Been- yeah. Which then was a five hundred dollar beta, and now is a full on collector car. Yeah, find one if you can. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean the most interesting thing about it, I think, is um, apart from the fact that obviously you know everything on it's an option, but the, I thought the suspension was really interesting. That they've got in, there's no anti roll bars, um, so the way they manage um, compression and so forth, and you know uh, suspension travel is they've got something some clever sort of little motor with the um the the, um the smarts on it on the stanchion of the suspension so you can use that on each corner to independently stiffen up and change the ride height on all four corners so if it drives over a pothole it can lower the wheel into the pothole and then as it comes back up it checks the road surface like 30 times a second or something so it can then bring it back up again so that it minimizes the amount it actually went in so when you're in a you're hard cornering as well, it can stiffen up the outside and soften up the inside so that you can corner flat. It could could lean it in, but apparently they tried that. It felt I, feel like, I feel like it's it's the 1990s and you're Murray Walker explaining Nigel Mansell's new Formula One car to me. It's pretty sick for something on an SUV. I mean, you know, it's although that's you know, that's uh that word is not acceptable. It's not an SUV. I don't know what Ferrari called it. I can't remember, but that's what it is. So I mean, it's, well, BMW, but, um, BMW don't build SUVs. They build SAVs, which are sports activity vehicles. I'll have you know. It's not... Uh... <laughs> Fair enough, Beamer. Beamer. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, as I say, it doesn't fill me particularly with last. I don't want one. I don't think it looks too bad. Um, but, um, yeah. yeah, it's just interesting to see them sort of loading in Doing, doing a Ferrari and doing it their own way. Um, and there's an electric motor on the front and so forth. So it can do four-wheel drive, but you still get a nose lift as an option if you want to lift the front end up. So it doesn't do that for you. It's all about performance and enhancing the driving experience rather than practicality. Yeah, um, yeah and, and, you know, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I've got to believe it will leave you flabbergasted to, to drive because yeah. one one thing with this sort of latest generation of of like hypercar of you know ultra powerful tall vehicles is all of everything's a superlative right it has 700 horsepower but the brakes are like the size of a 12 inch pizza and the tires are like so so it's it has the braking performance and the rubber on the road equivalent to like three or four Sierra Cosworths. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, gobsmacking. Let's not mess about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't say I want my, I don't really want anything in the Ferrari range much at the moment. I'd have a two nine six. Don't get me wrong, but um, that's about it. I'm not really bothered about much else. Yeah, I'd still rather have an one. O- Ollie and I went in Ferrari of Fort Lauderdale when we were in Florida um, and uh, I just let him wander, right? And and we and I found myself, and I I let him wander, you know, and and you know was made sure that the people in the place knew that I was with him, and I I, I wasn't going to totally let him run wild, you know. He, he, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't like wild child, in the, but bottom line is, we end up stood next to. Um, a 512, like BB, black one. And I'm like, you know, the modern stuff, I am sh- i don't know. It, it's all about the scenario in which you could enjoy it. And with these things, you know, if you drive them, you, you do love them. But I just don't feel the same lust for the modern stuff as I do for the older stuff. I, I feel a, a level of, I'd sell a kidney for the older stuff that, that um, I don't with the newer stuff. Um, uh, you also put on the agenda here this TTS racing supercharged Hayabusa. Well, like, I mean, maybe, maybe. Like, and this this TTS supercharged rocket. What what this is? There's some like hot rod company that do a boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's TTS TTS um, in the UK. They basically 
um, do modification packages for these bikes. Um, and, you know, they're fully specced and, and tweaked and, you know, um, yeah, I mean, and you know, I put the figures on there just because it's sort of ridiculous to almost to think about the numbers. You know, if I if you came out with a, 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 on a top trump card 10 years ago, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, chin on. That, that's they're not real. Um, but yeah, I mean, a nine second quarter mile, 220 miles an hour for the supercharged booster. Um, and the, the rocket supercharged rocket is, t- I mean, 270 foot pounds of torque. I mean, are you kidding me? Um, you, you know, where you remember years ago, Newton and I went out to uh, the Mojave Desert with our CBR 600 I've got to do land racing stuff and continually failed tech inspection, basically. Um, just nothing like prior planning to avoid piss poor performance, let me tell you. Um, uh, whilst we were out there one time, we got talking to a couple who were, well, they ran a pair of boosters, one supercharged, one turbocharged. Both of them had gone more than 200 miles an hour. And their background was, um, her background was master mechanic, engine builder in the aeronautics. He built the bodies for Tomahawk missiles. They're handcrafted. That's what he, there's like a bunch of craftsmen around, like who fucking knew? Well, these bikes were so, well, obviously we looked at the bikes, gushed over the bikes, learned the people's stories. Um, The bottom line is that the bike needs to make, the bike needs to be supercharged or turbocharged to do more than 200 miles an hour. You'd think out of the can, the booster could nearly do 200 miles an hour. And, you know, those early ones could do like 193 or 199 or whatever you whatever you believe. The bottom line is you now, at Bonneville at least, where the air is thinner and where you have the traction problems, you, you need, or, or, well, Mojave, you don't have the, the you know, the, the same um, thin atmosphere issues, but you still have... You, you know, you need a shit ton more than 250 horse. I think if you add 370, I think it could probably do 250. Not that I'm like an expert. Who knows? But... I mean, because I mean, it's it's an odd thing. I mean, because you can do the, the other way, that Alan Milliard video that I sent out of the, uh, the he's custom made a Viper 8 litre V10 motorbike. Um, <laughs> I mean, that thing do 200 miles an hour. Um, and he, the, he he, the, the onboard video he showed of it was like a gentle quarter throttle run and still knocks over 200 miles an hour. So, but I mean, it's it's an amazing engineering project. The guy's a genius, but uh, it's an impractical bike. I mean, clearly it's just way too big and long. The engine is a stress member even. It's still massive, um, but it's cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, we I mean, I don't know. It's, the, the, have... Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say the top speed runs sort of, I didn't see much point in them. Um, and then, you know, spending a day at Speed Week um, a few years ago on holiday, I mean, it was cool. It was great fun. So if I lived near there, I would find a reason to have some sort of project to go and do high speed runs. No question. I was really into it years ago. And, you know, I did a bit of stuff out there on bikes. But, and I've thought since I would go back with, with cars. So I have that, you know, five litre Mustang and I often knock around the notion that if you just called up Ford Racing and bought a crate 500 horse Windsor I could pay Campbell Ford the two grand which is the factory rate to do a motor swap and that caged uh, SN car 95 Mustang GTS it'd probably do I don't reckon 200 miles an hour, but if you think of it, right, the Ferrari GT, uh, the Ferrari um, Daytona could do 174 with 350 horse, right? The M5, uh, the E39 M5 can do 186 de-restricted with its 400 horse. With the 500 horse that an E60 M5 has de-restricted, that can do could do 206. My E55, which is 359 horse, it's an O2, the last of the like W210 blobby eye ones, um, that could do 175 de-restricted. 
be a bloody terrifying prospect, let me tell you, because I know how bloody terrifying that is anywhere north of, uh, yeah. Um, uh, my point being that if you buy a motor with 500 horse, the car, unless it's an aerodynamic brick, is going to be sniffing around 190 or 200 miles an hour. It's just yeah. a case of, of, of raw physics. Where it so happens that SN body style, what was that? It was the jelly meat boat. It was the jelly bean era. It was for took a Fox Mustang and thought, how can we make this aerodynamic? And that was the SN95 car. So I feel like, you know, you might say, well, E60 is much more aerodynamically sophisticated than a uh, shitty old Mustang. And I might agree with you, but, you know, we will uh, we we'll wait and see if you taped it up properly and all of that, you know. So I've thought about that, but I've also thought mm, it, you, it blows a tire and it's over, right? Uh, and yeah. I, no, it's is it is it that worth pursuing? No, I, I agree with you. Um, the idea of spinning out and rolling it doesn't appeal much. No, um, well, you, you know, you, you and, and let's let's be real. Uh, you know, you're the one checking the tire pressures. You're the one that missed the fact that you ran over a nail or something, which just made a little cut in the tire, but at 195 miles an hour, that little cut was a big tear. And, you know, you're eating hospital food despite the roll cage in it. You know, mm-hmm. I just, I, I, I'm i too old to, to have upside down accidents. It's yeah. the, bottom, the bottom line. That is a fair point. Um, so uh, we did our new year in in Santa Barbara with uh, with this this family that we've got to know quite well. I mean, I guess you know Dana's known the girl since she was uh, I say girl. I mean, middle age for now, but like you know, since they were at college in uh, in Paris together years ago. Um, anyway, bottom line, this is not some bloody soap opera about their family. Um, this is about the cars that they have. To, uh, um, so. She had a Tesla Model X, right? And you remember I told you the door fell on her head. And um, the shoddy build quality, he is not a car guy. And he commented to me on the shoddy build quality. He's not a car guy, but he is a Porsche guy. So the comparison, I think, was quite noticeable and jarring for him. Um, And after the door fell on her head, I mean, you're like, Anyway, so uh, um, so I was quite surprised that she had another one. It looked at the Audi e-tron. Nah. Needs three rows, no three row BMW. It's not coming anytime soon. So, you know, the lease was up. So she had another one, right? Now, again, right, you can do the played or the range. She was like, I bet you'd have had the played. I was like, actually, no. Because of my, we just talked about this with the EV6 and EV6 GT and Mackie and, you know, we, we, we I was like, no, you know, I, I, uh, I wouldn't actually, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I like, uh, I, so this one's grey and the interior is noticeably nicer. I'm not somebody who really compares this stuff, but the, the, the interior on these new ones is, is, is noticeably better. Um, but it has one of these, like, you know, space invader, um, you know, Top Gun Maverick, um, steering wheels, right? Where it's not a complete wheel. It's, it's, it's not just squared off at the bottom. It, it, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's only like, it's between a uh, nine o'clock and 11 o'clock on one side and, and, you know, three o'clock and one o'clock on, on, on the other side. Um. So she was complaining about that. And and we we went out for a little drive. Well, I mean, we were just hanging out. So when the time that we were there, when we were going out, I happened to be sat next to her in the passenger seat one time when, when we were driving. And in normal operation, it's not a thing, right? But when we were going up some winding driveway, she'd been complaining about it. But actually watching her use it, it was not like a steering wheel, but it was arguably better because you could just put your hand underneath it and push it. The whole thing was like a large PlayStation console, like controller, rather than, uh, mm. yeah. So, um, 
I first saw that on an arcade game about 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. That, that sort of hand. Yeah. You, you, and, you and the design genius at back in Tesla. Was he in Duster's, Duster's Arcade in Plymouth as well? Arcade was in Plymouth. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about Duster's Arcade in Plymouth just the other day. Why was I thinking about it? Oh, I know why I was thinking about it. Do you remember that game? that was, uh, it was like on, you were on a road and you had some kind of hot rod muscle car and it was, it was, so it's like similar layout to Outrun, but it was like in a kind of science fiction neon light space. And the car was clearly a muscle car. And, and I remember, I remember I was, and, and I was looking at a new retro wave video that reminded me of that computer game. And that computer game reminded me of, of, uh, of being, in dusters with with you and and dance which was really seedy looking back dusters in plymouth by the way for for listeners which has long since disappeared sadly gone yeah know. sadly gone the other one that you boys used to play was the fighting game where uh, they were like the two of you and it was like a platformer but it was from a like three quarter elevated perspective golden and, axe no no it wasn't like barbarian fighting it was like uh, we would it was like a two player. You were like two brothers. Yeah, yeah. you could play Golden Axe multiple player as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you might have been Nox. That was the ones where yeah, you. That was, that was, that the, was one. the one where you, the, the intro was you slid in and then all jump did a massive skid. I think in a nine eleven ragtop turbo, and then you jumped out of it and then landed with your two SMGs or Mac teens or whatever you were running, and uh, then had to beat up like junkies that would throw like diseased needles at you and stuff. <laughs> Quality yeah. game. <laughs> uh, you can tell they were diseased because they were like bright green. Yeah, yeah, that, obviously. Obviously, yeah. 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 Um, so uh the other thing that yeah, that he's he's got a new Cayenne GTS. And it's in that um I, it's not. It's, I want to say pewter, but I'm not sure if it is pewter. It's in this, you know, dove grey. The, the the like the the non the where it's. What am I looking for? Like earth tones. If I'm not showing a bit of interior design pretension there, it's it's a. Either way, it's an amazing color, right? It it is, and and the thing is is, you know, I said to him, you know, at first Ollie and I were disappointed you got rid of the Panamera, but you know. Now we're not, because it sounds better than the Panamera. And, uh, you know, for most of the people, most of the time in California, he's right when he says, you know, I've got the Cayenne because it's higher. It's like higher up. It's easy to get the kids in and out. My first thought was, well, you've got one bloody SUV. Why do you need another one? But the point is that people know what's right for their lifestyle. And having spent that time with them, I can see why... uh, he was like, Ollie, um, Ollie was like, can you put it in Sport Plus? So he did, right? But he you know, like sat behind other traffic. So he's going, arr, arr, and having all this like falling into potholes and having, having this like savage throttle response and snatching at gears driving down the high street. And I'm like, no, no, this is for the, like, this is for the motorway on ramp. You know, this is the, the. Yeah. Yeah. I spent most of my time in the M2 in comfort. <laughs> Mostly because uh, unless you actually want to drive, it's just, yeah, uncivilized. Yeah. The next item on my little agenda is, you know, I brand this as motoring historian, right? But we, I never actually, as I said, I, I feel like there's a kind of bait and switch going on. You were expecting, you know, the history of, you know, the Tripoli Grand Prix. And instead, you know, you're getting uh, us bollocksing on about new cars. Well, firstly, you know, unlucky. And secondly, you must like it if you listen for, for this long. But but what I was going to say was I was going to actually talk about the fact that I have done a little bit of history recently. Mm-hmm. And I've not spoken to you, Mark, about this. So your reaction is genuine and unforced. There we go, breaking down that third wall um, again. So I wrote a piece about the Silver Arrows, the German racing cars from before the Second World War, Auto Union, kind of like modern Audi and Mercedes Benz. And, you know, really, I think the basis of modern Formula One in that, you know, it's like uh, a pinnacle 
technical competition as a um, national competition. You know, you tra- it's the traveling circus. To me, that was the beginning of, of the traveling circus. Now, I, after I wrote the paper, the, the person that reviewed it said they thought that it was that was maybe present in the 1920s. And I'm now going to have to go away and do another load of, of research to see if I think that I just was wrong. Or, or if I'm going to try and defend my uh, defend my position, um, and I guess that's the bottom line with this work was that I I did a lot of reading, but the reading that I did was mostly in the 1990s, and I missed this one crucial book that was published in 2008, which is basically everything that I'd written about, but of course done much better, not least because the bloke that wrote it is German, so can read or the German language books. And the bloke reviewing my essay was like, yeah, you know, but, you know, you basically say most of the sources are in German. I can't read German. And also um, the sources that you have used, you've gone on to say, well, they're biographies that were written after the war when the drivers and the team manager and so on, they're all trying to distance themselves from everything that was Germany in the 1930s. So, you know, I, I, so I had, had been, I had basically said that I felt that they'd done the different drivers that I, I looked at, I looked at four. Um, I basically said that I thought they'd done quite a good job of, of being apolitical. And the reviewer, as, as said, you know, on the contrary, have a look at this other book written by this German bloke who dug deeper into the past and found that, you know, the bloke that said he'd never worn a Nazi uniform, there's a ton of pictures of him doing it, that when Rossemeyer was killed, his, you know, he was, he, he was like David Beckham in terms of being outside of motorsport he was an icon in the popular imagination because, you know, he wasn't married to Pospice. He was married to a, a woman aviatrix, you know, one of these like acrobatic distance flyers. Um, Ellie Beinhorn was anyway, whatever. The, the, the point is that uh, she's almost more interesting than, than him. If you uh, uh, read, read about them, the relationship's really interesting. Anyway, um, uh, uh, where was I going? I was going somewhere. Are you talking about the source material and the chap having done deeper research um, and uh, some of the stuff that they purported not being quite uh, on the level? Oh, the bottom line was I'd just not read the right book. I like and the book was published in a period where I thought I'd read just about everything there was to read. So I, I got egg on my face somewhat. I, I do feel that. And, and I'm I've moved from the, the stage of being. Um, miffed that I'd done that, not miffed at the messenger, at the message or the messenger, miffed at the fact that I'd done that to feel it. Well, all right, I need to go away and do a lot of work to kind of restructure what what I'm doing. And I should say, you know, what I've tried to say is is in an era of um, government where government is putting pressure on people to do things that are uh, not ethical or, or not moral. How do people respond and how do people who are in positions of, of uh, not leadership, but positions of kind of responsibility, how do they uh, how do they respond to that? Hmm. So I talked about um, Von Braukic, the Mercedes driver, Caracciola, the other Mercedes driver. And I misspell his name throughout. Fucking embarrassing. Um But, you know, it's my poor attention to detail. Right. I didn't grammarly my own piece, you know. Like, Easy you, know, done, mate. you know, yeah, you'd think you'd think I didn't have any experience editing other people's work, wouldn't you? Um, Herman Lang and um, uh, Hans Stuck, and I guess von Braukic, um, defected to East Germany after the war, and it's all a bit of a sad story. The, the Belgrade Grand Prix of 1939, right four days after the war started, four days after the invasion of Poland, the morning that Neville Chamberlain declared war. Lang came down to breakfast. Neubauer, the team manager, is like, where's Braukic? He's like, oh, I don't know. Braukic gets in the car, drives to the airport. 
Von, Br- um, Von Braukic, um, uh, Neubauer gets in the car, drives to the airport. Von Braukic is on the plane. The plane's about to take off. He pulls him off the plane and says, you've got a race. Only subsequent, this is what he says in his biography, right? So who knows whether or not it's true. He says, only subsequently did I realise that the plane was going to Switzerland. So this son of the Prussian military family is, you know, fleeing to... So so you've got... So I got to think... So, so clearly, right, this was not somebody who drank the Nazi Kool-Aid, right? Despite the fact that he's like a Nazi poster child, despite the fact that he's appeared in a movie, um, in a movie with like a Hollywood actress about a racing driver, and you know he's he's a movie star. So that was he was the one guy that, and I've a signed picture of him, right? So I feel like which I bought twenty years ago, um, twenty five years ago now. So I, you know, he's always been the 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 figure for me. That that fit that photograph that got me involved with the Silver Hours in the first place of the 1937 British Grand Prix. There's a photograph at Donington of, of the car wheeling up the hill. Like it's on, it's doing a wheel stand. It's two wheels off the ground. That photograph is, is of Von Braukic. And that's the picture that I would say didn't just get me into the Silver Hours, got me into Formula One, got me into motoring history. It, it all stems from that one picture. So hence my interest in, in Von Braukic. Um, uh, Caracciola, uh, bought a villa in Switzerland before the war and was always like up at the villa and up at the villa and just stayed up at the villa. That's what he did, basically. And I, my thought about that is that, you know, he was the most successful driver of the era. And you can say, well, he, he was not as fast as Rossmeyer and Lang was better by by the end. And I think those things are, are absolutely true. But I feel like anybody who can come out of the whole debacle of the war and you know the whole like thing as slickly as Caracciola did I'm reminded of of the circuit that his villa in Lugano is closest to is Ben and the feature at Ben was cobbles and it was like fast and sweeping if you look at a track map a lot of the corners are kind of Thruxton churchy but over cobbles and it would rain a lot. So you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine what, what that was like. So, so anybody who can slide and 500, 600 horsepower Mercedes Benz <clears throat> Grand Prix car at 150 miles an hour, which is what it took to set a decent lap time. Then, you know, this was drift and, and, you know, yeah. So, um, and as I said, Lang, Lang's working class. Lang's a motor uh, motorcycle racer, has a good career, has brothers who are killed motorcycle racing, who still has a good career. But then when the Weimar Republic collapses, loses any chance of being a racing driver and has to like try and make ends meet and survive any way he can, ends up working for Daimler-Benz, ends up being on the Mercedes team, actually being... Um, I can't remember who's chief mechanic, but he was chief mechanic. And then in his biography, he describes this train ride back from Monza after they'd done some testing up back to, to Stuttgart and sharing the carriage with him was this other mechanic, Zimmer, who he'd raced with years ago and the designer, car designer, and uh, uh, the race. Uh, and until that conversation where Zimmer and Lang had been bantering about some oil that Zimmer had borrowed for a race that they'd done like a decade before, a hill climb, like a motorcycle hill climb. Zimmer was basically, Lang won everything, right? There was this period where Lang, and that's what Zimmer alluded to. The designer, whose name escapes me, heard that and was, and from then on, wanted to campaign to let Lang drive the car. But the whole social class thing, meant that Lang wasn't really allowed and 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 eventually he got there but the first time he ever drove a Grand Prix car was the 646 horse Mercedes W125 like that was the that was like his introduction there was no like Formula Ford or anything like that there was no warm up there was like straight out there and the circuit if you google up a map of the Melhalla Tripoli Grand Prix circuit. 
If I tell you it was faster than Spa, faster than Monza, the average speed, and it's all like these crazy sweeping turns through like, you know, between palm trees and, and, and so on. You know, because it's like the North African coast. It was, it was when, uh, it was when you know Mussolini had his like ambitions, his colonial ambitions, and and the Tripoli Grand Prix was like a showpiece. It was like a resort. It looked like it looks like you know Cuba used to in the nineteen fifties. That's how it. Uh, that, that that's how it uh, how it looked. He won first time out. Like unbelievable. Like that unbelievable. Um. So Lang and, and then Stuck and Stuck's the really interesting one because he, he was, his wife had a Jewish grandfather. So although officially she wasn't Jewish, the brown shirts had all these like spit on stuck kind of campaigns going on, right? Well, you know what Stuck did, right? And this is just like eye popping, right? He wrote to Himmler and said, can you stop this? So Himmler organised for it to be stopped. <laughs> I mean, okay, go to the head of the problem, right. I suppose. Yeah. Right, he went to Hitler and said, uh, I, I really want to do the land speed record. You know, the Brits hold the land speed records. I'm mates with Malcolm Campbell. Like, damn it, I want to do the land speed record. And Hitler went, great. Go and do it. Go and do it. I give this project my blessing. So they designed the car, this Mercedes T80. That was the, the, if you Google that up, it looks like it's a bloody spaceship. You've never seen. The Allies, when they found it, didn't know what it was. They thought it was like a Nazi super weapon. I had no idea what it was. It was it was Stuck's land speed record car. Um, and and the, the, uh, when it seemed, when Stuck heard rumours that he was not going to be the driver that the that you know the people around Hitler wanted to put somebody who was you know like Lang a, a working class hero not you know a uh, foppish you know traveling aristocrat with a jewish wife who was a tennis pro by the way they were to- totally gatsby racing driver and tennis pro um you know so there's a the whole like social class thing going on there as well, which we which we see reflected in the modern era somewhat as as, as well. Um, uh, where was I going with Stuck and the uh, um, when he heard that they were going to put someone else in the car? Oh yeah, yeah. He went to the Berlin Motor Show because he heard Hitler was going to be there and walked up to him and said, um, "Who who's going to be driving the Land Speed Record car?" And Hitler went loudly so the whole entourage could hear, Stuck will be driving the land speed record car. In other words, he knew that Stuck's request to see him had been denied by people in the office and so on. So when Stuck walked right up to him, eyeballed him, he said loudly, so all the brown shirts around him who were, you know, cat. So I just thought that was interesting because it shows how, you know, it's the the politics laid bare, but it also shows how Stuck wasn't really that interested in the whole, like, you know, it didn't matter what Hitler said about, you know, hating on the Jews. That didn't matter at all. It was only for me to be able to do my motor racing. Don't you understand? And similarly, Caracciola with being like, well, this is clearly a load of bollocks and this bloke's a wanker. He delivered him a Mercedes in 1926 and Hitler gabbed on a lot and, you know, and and you know and was unimpressed well at least that's what Caraccio says in his biography post-war pre-war he says something slightly different but you know post-war the he, but you know he was up in Switzerland right he wasn't exactly trying to be like hang on a minute this I can't be involved in this I just want to they were just about wanting to to go motor racing but the final what I want to end with and it's just I I, I, I just so telling of the time right Hitler says go and see the head of the air force and ask him for an engine so Stuck goes to see this guy Ernst Udet who was a World War One fighter ace and says can I have one of the most fuck off engines you've got to build this lad speed record car to go faster than Campbell and Seagrave and these bloody Englishmen and Udet says come and see me in two weeks right so when Stuck sees him in two weeks' time, he has not one, but t- 
two of these giant jet engines. So Stuck goes back to Hitler and says, can I do a boat as well? I want to do a boat as well. And I'm just like, you know, that was the spirit, which, you know, is just, um, it's Gatsby, right? It's not the, it, it's, so to be like, to so to, and, and, you know, with our eyes, we look back and we say, well, should you, you know, should you really have been, you know, so keen to do the land speed record that you were happy to drive a car with a swath sticker on it, even though you absolutely knew how evil the policies were and how they affected people. You know, the Gestapo raided your hotel room one Monaco Grand Prix weekend, you know, like you knew what it was. So there's a lot of nuance there. And I was a butt munch to not properly review all the literature and miss this key book, which this German bl- journalist had written about this very topic. So I don't know. I might read his book and be like, actually, I don't have anything valid to say. But I usually have a lot to say, don't I? I just so uh, I see the time as as run on as it usually does, Mark. Um, I have a few quick fires here for us to uh, to, to wrap up with. Um, what's the car you most regret parting in? E773 NKV Vulture Man The Ford Sierra in Gris or whatever the uh, whatever version of Grey it was with uh, uh, the, the first car I owned. Loved it. I mean, the fact that it ended up all mouldy and we had to get rid of it. I mean, it, it, we did have to get rid of it, but if I could have a car back lurking on the drive, that would be the one. Yeah, grey Sierra two litre base, wasn't it? It was rare in that it was a base. It never had any wheel caps all the time that, that you had it. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, a worthy uh, a worthy choice. Um I test drove when I was a student a blue Ford Capri three liter S. Um it was lovely it had that tartan interior but blue nice. um it, it was a tea plater um when i got back to the house and told the bloke i'd call him in the morning he called me a <laughs> door for being a charm for being a time waster <laughs> oh, dear. um and i really wish um because i was I really was in a place where, you know, he was probably right that I probably wouldn't have bought the car, but I still felt, you know, at the time I, 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 and I looking back now, I wish I had gone with a hundred bucks in my pocket because I'd have given him the money and then found a way to make the rest um, whole. But, you know, Mm -hmm. But I don't know what I would have done with it, and I would, would have had to keep it outside, and I couldn't have insured it, and yeah. But oh, mate, I would have liked that Renault Five Turbo, the, the the baggy one that Angie's um, housemate had. Um, yeah, yeah. Was it reliable? No. Did it did it look just right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wondered, but yeah, I didn't have both face lift in that same grey as as your Sierra was. Um, all right, worst car you ever owned? I thought about that. Um, I don't think I've owned a shit car. The worst car I've ever actually had for any period of time um, was when I swapped um, the Cupra R I had, that say at Leon Cupra R, for my mate to drive it down at Le Mans and had his dog-eared GTI in that awful era where Volkswagen were like doing the red, I think it was even before they were doing the, the red letters on the GTI that had actual different horsepower level. And it was just some baggy shit, 130 horsepower piece of crap. Uh, and it was awful. Um, it that was golf, horrendous. Like a Golf yeah. Mark IV or something. Yeah, it was It was like ugly and slow and knackered. Um, and I hated it. No wonder he needed the Cooper to go to Le Mans. Well, I mean, it was about five times the car in every way. It was just so much better looking, better performance, just better. Uh, most loyal dog? I've never owned a dog. No, no actual dog, like car. <laughs> um, I feel that that ought to be uh, 
oh, what can I remember the reg of this one? Was it R323CNE? That um, red Laguna company car I had. That was a beater of an old dog, and I, I kind of loved it. It was shit, but delivered in a sort of enthusiastic French way that made it good. You know, I, I liked it. Uh, it went dirty and handbrake turned regularly um, across the dirt drive to where I was living on that farm. Well, with you for some period of time. Um, yeah, I have fond memories of that car, even though it wasn't a good car, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, the pool car. Mm-hmm. Um, I would pick uh, um, that black Mondeo ST24 that, that we use. Former. Yeah, yeah. That I use for um, well, we did six thousand miles in that car between us, didn't we? Over two or three different different summers yep. before it succumbed to the uh, to the great scrap man in the sky. But yeah, really sad to to see that car go. Um, really wish I could have found a way to keep it. Um, that Yamaha motor, what a what a gem! I mean, that was a that was a fast car, at utterly clapped out. I mean, we we I paid. I mean, we went together to look at it, didn't we? I, what did I pay? 350 quid for it, 320 quid, something like that. I, I did not pay uh, a, a lot of money for it. Um, what's the best road that you've driven in Europe? We talked about America uh, a couple of, or maybe last time, didn't we? Best road. Ooh, that's difficult. I mean, there's some excellent roads around the Nürburgring um, that are better than the Nürburgring in lots of ways. Um you could say spa in that technically it used to be roads, but like, and that's cheating because it's a track, but it is amazing. Um, I don't know. There are some great roads in the, in the Alps. Um, I dr- the, dr- the road, if you don't take the Mont Blanc tunnel and you go up over the top um, instead um, from wherever, I'm trying to remember where we were, but it um, doesn't really help people to find it on the map. Unfortunately, if I can think of it, I'll put a link in it. But um, I had a wonderful period where I was driving that McGann RS um, and about eight bikes of various naked and sports bike types came past. And um, the sort of the gods were with me for a bit in terms of traffic flow. And I was able to sort of clip along behind them at about 95 to a ton 10 for about half an hour on sort of wonderful long sweeping roads, uh, like in, on the plain in between the sort of the mountain top bits, just stunning. So. And some of the roads up out of Italy around Lake Como. Lake Como is just too nagery, but um, there's some nice roads around there. Um, Como. I, I, I haven't got a top road, to be honest. I, I need to work on it. Como is where uh, Caracciola lived. That, that mm. area. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. Lugano. Um, mm. I, uh, so my pick's the Alps as well. Um, I, I drove from Turin to Chambry to retrace. Giuseppe Farina, first Formula One world champion, to retrace his last draft. So he was invited to participate in um, John Frankenheimer's Grand Prix. And that morning he hopped in his Lotus Cortina in Turin and drove up over the Alps um, on his way to uh, to, to Rams, as uh, as I understand that you say it, and, uh, and the French Grand Prix. And uh, uh, when they found the car, it was wrapped around a lamppost and the speedo was pegged at 170 kilometers an hour, which if I to, um, to understand it, that's about 115 miles an hour, which is about Lotus Cortina's maximum. So I think he hit ice. I think that and, and Fangio famously said about it, you know, he would whenever Farina crashed, he would always think the Virgin was going to look after him. And Fangio's point was, you know, I guess the Virgin stopped looking after him. When I drove the road, the Virgin had not stopped looking after him. He he was doing what he loved. The car was in a full-blooded four-wheel drift with the throttle wide open, 115 miles an hour. And at 60, he hit the lamppost and died. End. The Virgin was with him to the very end. So the road, I think, is... Um, if you, I mean, it, it is the. I bought an atlas of Italy, a, a road atlas of Italy in the fifties, and looked at the main road. And the road that I drove, um, I think it was SS twenty or something like that. But it does, uh, you, you know, I I uh, should have planned this better, shouldn't I? But no, I followed a camper van up the hill, 
in in this little a3 diesel rental car that, that i had poor thing and uh the first climb i was like i'm not going to pass but then the second switch back it was a really long straight and i thought i'll pass and when i passed the camper van uh, there was like nothing there was no other traffic on that road and i went up the switchbacks all the way up the hill getting faster and faster and faster and feeling like it was a computer game and then over the top of the hill coming out of italy and into france the road surface improved and it was like a computer game with these sweeping down hills where you could could look i mean i was doing racing lines even though there was just sheer drop off i wasn't like leaning on the car that hard but i it was because you could see right the the way down like that kind of stelvio mm. pass but more open mm. less switchbacky and and more and 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 more open and um yeah, so the Alps uh, are, are... Well, yeah, I mean, and don't get me wrong, I did some lovely driving in the Pyrenees last summer. There's some stunning roads down there as well. A lot of little, little ones are just too small. You know, they're, they're beautiful views, pretty, but you can't really enjoy driving them because, you know, a single lane with passing places with no runoff. And, you know, it, yeah. Um, what's the best track in Britain? Um, I can only say the ones I've driven on, which is only a few. Um, I've done Thruxton, I've done Brands Hatch Indy. Um, I think, I mean, the one I like the most that I've driven was Donington. Um, there is a cheat here, isn't there? Is the TT course really? But if you discount the TT course, I had Thruxton, I was between Thruxton and Orton. I think Orton's good. I've not I've never done track day at Orton, so I don't really know. But I, mm. but Thruxton is is well, Thruxton's good. quality, yeah. Um, you've got a hundred thousand dollars. What do you buy? Hundred grand. What do I buy? Uh, what in one thing, or am I buying a small garage full of? Uh, <laughs> Your choice. Oh, oh, and in which case, I buy. Probably a, a nice tidy 997 GTS, sorry, 997 Carrera S with the right kit on it, with the right alloys on it. I buy uh, a dirt bike. I probably buy, I might even buy one of those BMW M1000Rs because I quite like the idea of that ridiculous 200 and something horsepower in a naked because uh, increasingly sports bikes less they make less because they're even more ridiculous to ride than. Um, supercars in the sense that you can get there even faster than the supercar to, to, the, to the not just the license losing but to the uh oh the accident is wet sort of time um even more scarily fast um but yeah uh, and and then i don't know i kind of like the idea of having one of those if i can get a dog-eared 760 il or m60 or something um, m6 or something like that so i can have a nice four-door car as well <laughs> but uh with ridiculous power and then i'll keep the other 15 grand to put fuel in it for about three weeks uh oh man um i would do and i did uh, this is like an off the cuff like i've not thought too deeply about this um i would do uh i really want a julie ram i've not like got out of the way of of uh i know exactly the year and the spec that, that i want it's taken me a long time to to get but i really would love a two-wheel drive extended cab 2016 17 julie ram um i would also do and not least because i feel like i missed the boat on this i would love a really nice original daily drivable well, not daily drivable, but like usable, like the cars that I drive every day are muscle car. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of, I, I would do a Firebird, but it's too much like the Camaro. I would really love a Boss Mustang, like a 69, 70 Boss 302 Mustang with a four speed, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel uh, there's a timelessness about them. I feel something of a Mustang fraud having only had you know, later era ones that are like a reflection and a reference to, to, to the earlier ones. So I would like, uh, I'd like to do something like, uh, I'd like to do something like that. Um, you know what I was going to say? Um, we talked about the scariest moment you've ever had in a car and I was going to do a little reprise of, of, of that. I can't remember what I said, 
when when we talked about it before but i i actually think the oh when i pranged that white sierra that we both owned um oh, yeah. no i i also had a pretty terrifying moment in the era of the econoline club wagon van 1992 twin toe brown stanford excess property auction 720 dollars um do you remember well you maybe don't because you maybe didn't know jason at that time but our buddy uh, jason has uh um used to oh, i live with for a while used to have volvo 240 station wagons because you could pick them up cheap and you could fit a bike in the back of them and jason was all about the bike racing so that was you know that was the criteria so when i first moved to california i helped him with the running costs of the the 240 that, that he had at the time and the brakes started to grind and he said to me don't worry about it the brakes can grind forever and it's fine like I've had two other Volvos and the brakes can grind forever and it's fine. And the brakes ground forever and it was fine. And eventually we did. So I was like, the brakes can grind forever, right? That was my thought with the van. Well, I'm telling you, they can't because the, the, the pedal went to the fucking floor when I was trying to get slow from like 80 to like, you know, 60 to merge with traffic to an extent that I abandoned any attempt to merge and continued on because I was it literally the pedal just went straight to the floor and I pumped and nothing happened. You know, the pedal was was it was so that was uh, a pretty um, sphincter clenching. Uh, yeah, that would pucker one up, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what are you reading at the moment? Um, we're plugging the book. Not, You're not reading anything because yeah, we, I, I am. I've are, just been spending all my time writing and editing and writing and the, the chronicles and, of yeah. Alvar and Clarence. Go to Amazon and buy it now. Um, mm. I, I am reading a biography of David Pearson called Twenty One Forever," and motor racing biographies are often lightweight. And I think this qualifies as the most lightweight motor racing biography I think I've ever read. And I think the real tragedy is this is apparently the only one. This is there are no other. Uh, you know, maybe he was as simple as he as he comes across. I don't mean simple as in dumb. Maybe he was as you know as much like a character in a country music song as he as he seems to be. I I uh, yeah I don't know. It, it it's. Uh, I crave more depth. You know, there's more depth with Junior Johnson. There's more depth with Richard Petty. The, the, it's, I, I'm struggling to find it with this uh, uh, this uh, David Pearson biography. Um, all right. Um, really appreciate your time again, Mark. We've just ticked it's over. It's all good, man. Um, have, uh, have a good one. And uh, I'll speak to you next time. Ciao.